Point Blank is a crime fiction podcast. It may not be suitable for all listeners. We discuss violence in all its forms. The works we reference may include period slang, which some listeners may find offensive. The hosts also have a tendency to swear. Episode 10. The Postman Always Rings Twice. Welcome to another episode of Point Blank. My name is Kurt, and joining me as always is Justin. How are you doing today, Justin? I'm all right, Kurt. Uh, good to chat with you again. Looking forward to this episode. Yeah, me too. I really enjoyed uh, I enjoyed this one, so we'll get to that in a minute. But anything new and exciting in the world of hard-boiled uh, noir and detective fiction for you? I've been buying a hell of a lot of books, and I am not able to read them at the rate that I'd like, but I've been chipping away. I have growing stacks all over the house. I actually need a new bookshelf, and that is a testament to the success of this podcast, I guess. We're still interested in the material. Uh, I'm not sick of it yet, So, and there's so much to work from. There's just endless amounts of books, so now that we're at episode 10 and starting to get through some of these initial classics, we're going to go off the rails a bit. And I'm curious to see which books we prioritize and how we decide what to review each month. So uh, there's a lot of exciting things ahead in our future as we make some adjustments and, uh, and keep moving forward. So I guess I'm just feeling generally optimistic and excited about all the great things I get to read in the, in the coming years. So that's where I'm at. I've been tackling some new stuff. I'll get to in the five round burst, some new books and, stuff like that. So that's me. How about you, sir? Oh, I hear you. My piles of uh, of books are just growing. And it seems like for every one episode we do of this, I can think of about four or five more episodes I want to do. So exactly. I I don't think we're going to run out of material anytime soon. And this doesn't even include for me the Kindle books I buy just like in between physical books I purchase and, and get in the mail, I buy like three or four Kindle books, which I then promptly ignore. And then I log into Kindle every once in a while and go, holy shit, I just bought like 20 books this month. And I haven't even, I don't even, I don't like reading on the Kindle very much. So I usually use it as a last resort. I, I'm going to have to take myself off into the woods at some point without my books in order to catch up on that stuff. Well, then you won't be able to charge your Kindle, so... You'll have a problem there. That That's true. I'll, I'll have to eat it. <laughs> but I yes, I feel your pain. And just uh, one thing for the listeners, since we're talking about future episodes, is one thing we're going to try here in the near future. This is episode 10. This is probably going to be the last episode that we do the full length. You know, these things are creeping up to an hour and a half, um, and we could probably even give you more on that. Uh, but what we'd like to do is we want to split these episodes basically in half. We want to do two episodes a month say 30 to 45 minutes per episode. And that way we're going to give you the reviews, um, the short discussion, um, maybe a little teaser for the main topic book in the first episode of the month. And then we'll get into our deep discussion in the second episode of the month. And this is going to do a couple things for us. One, it'll give you more episodes, which is great. And two, it is also probably, we're hoping, (laughs) going to make the editing of the episodes a little smoother. That way, Justin and I aren't sharing such large files back and forth, and uh, we can each just take one half of that larger episode and work on that, and uh, that'll make our lives a little little bit easier. So look for that in the future. Justin, is uh, any other related media or anything you want to talk about? It's a good question. No, nothing. Okay. Well, I, How about you? I'm sure you have something. I do have a couple of things to talk about. Uh, one, and this is going to sound crazy because I think so many of the people who listen to the show have probably already seen this show, and a lot of writers cite this show as one of the top crime shows ever put on television, but I have finally gotten around to watching The Wire. Um Oh, yeah. I, ne- yeah. I never watch. I didn't watch a lot of TV during the time span that it was on. And it's just never been on a, a streaming service that I had. So I finally said, I'm going to watch this. And I'm just in uh, the first season and I'm, I am enjoying it. It is, however, interesting to see just how dated the show is at this point. But I'm really enjoying that. And I'll maybe have more to say as I get further along uh, in the series. But a new one that uh, I've been watching on Netflix, and this is for our neo-noir fans, those fans of Blade Runner and stuff like that, 
I've been watching uh, Altered Carbon, and this is this is really I, I think really good. If you're if you're into that Blade Runner kind of stuff, you really should watch Altered Carbon. I don't want to give too much away because there's a lot of reveals in the show, but basically you have this uh, this mysterious guy who is uh, brought essentially back to life. In this future, they have the our physical bodies are often referred to basically as shells, and then our brains are stored on these little data things. And if you have enough money, uh, you basically can't die because you just get put back into a new shell. Um, and despite this, uh, a very rich guy gets murdered and he wants to know, well, not murdered, but killed. And then he has to go into his clone. And the whole plot is them trying to uncover who this murderer is and why. And of course, it gets much more complicated than that. Uh, but I think it's very well done and I'm enjoying it. I'm glad you're enjoying it. I have it on my watch list, but I wasn't sure. I, I, I've I've heard some mixed reviews and I wasn't sure if those reviews uh, were accurate or some of this propaganda pushed by people who, you know, people who want to criticize anything new because it, it challenges the status quo or whatever. So I'm glad to hear a, a strong opinion and the fact that it might be Blade Runner-ish. Uh, I like the idea of clones or shells. Uh, it sort of evokes one of the, the books I'm going to talk about a little bit in uh, Five Round Burst, too. I, I love that futuristic stuff. One thing I'm excited about that I, I it isn't out yet, but the Coen brothers are putting together a, a short, I guess it's like a mini series that it's, but it's on Netflix and it's a Western. And I assume it's going to be noirish, you know, sort of like a noir Western called the ballad of like, I don't know, Buster Scruggs or something. I know very little about it, but I just saw it pop on one of my feeds the other day again. And I'm really curious to see what they do with the long format. Cause I'm a huge Coen brothers fan and they haven't really worked uh, in the television format before with anything longer than a couple hours. So uh, looking forward to that uh, on the near horizon. Yeah, for sure. That sounds good. And I mean, I, I think Netflix is a good, you know, good place for the Coen brothers to be because they seem to let their, their people do have creative control over what they want to want to make. So yeah, I'll be looking forward to that one as well. I've got one more item and that is a, a computer game and I have just downloaded this. I haven't actually had a chance to really get into it. But the game is called A Case of Distrust, and what sold me on this, and it was just sort of an immediate uh, download for me, is it's inspired by the works of Raymond Chandler, and it's more of a game that's kind of one of those interactive novels, not necessarily a, like a point-and-click adventure, but a, an interactive novel, and the artwork is in the style of Saul Bass, and in, if you're not familiar with who Saul Bass is, when you immediately see the art style, you'll know who you're talking about. I mean, this just, he did so many, some of the fa more, most famous like movie posters and stuff uh, out there. So that was a must buy for me. And it, it takes place in uh, Prohibition era, San Francisco. And the PI is uh, Phyllis Malone. And uh, you, it's, it's, I think it's like 15 bucks right now. I wouldn't be surprised. This is a, uh, this is available on steam right now for PC and, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see some sort of app game uh, version of this uh, in the near future. So I'll let, maybe let you know uh, what I think of it uh, in a future episode. Yeah, please do. Well, on to our reviews. And this time for Five Round Burst, we're going to split it up a little bit. We're both going to give you some reviews. And Five Round Burst is when we do we do five reviews in roughly five minutes. Our first book for today is White Jazz by James Elroy. This came out in 1992 from Vintage Books, and this is the last book of the uh, the L.A. Quintet. And here we follow the corrupt cop Klein in 1958 L.A. as he tries to basically cover his ass from the heat that's coming from all sides. He's basically looking to get out. The LAPD, the federal investigators, racketeers, and drug kingpins are all part of the heat that's coming on to Klein. The story is gritty and brutal, full of greed and perversion, and this is the kind of thing one comes to expect from James Elroy. This was a hit for me, but I had a little bit of a hard time getting into the book, and part of that came from Elroy's style and the first person almost uh, stream of conscious thought of the main character, Klein. But once, once I got into it, 
it, it really, it really hit me. And it also left me with this feeling of exhaustion and exhaustion in kind of a good way, because I was just exhausted by all of these things that this corrupt cop had to do to keep, keep his ass alive. Ultimately, this is the tale of the corrupt cop done right. And it's a hit like a 38, two to the chest and one to the head. All right. The first book I want to talk about is called The Hard Bounce by Todd Robinson, published by Tyrus Books in 2012. This is the debut novel by Robinson, who was the creator and editor of Thuglet, an excellent crime fiction magazine that sadly went under back in 2016. The Hard Bounce introduces the big boy protagonist duo of Boo Malone and Junior, bouncers at a rundown Boston liquor joint called The Cellar, and the twin engines of an amateur security firm called 4DC. They get hired to find Cassandra, prodigal daughter of the district attorney. The case leads them into a sordid world of gangsters, snuff film, and crooked cops. The case also triggers in Boo memories of his childhood as a ward of the state and kindles in him a need to find his long-lost sister. Full of hard-nosed fisticuffs and wise-cracking banter and rich with pathos, the hard bounce is an enjoyable ride to the seedy side of Boston. Though the hero's sophomoric humor doesn't always work for me, the novel as a whole is a solid hit. Back to you, Mr. Ellison. That sounds like a good one. I'd like to, I'd like to maybe put that on my read list. Up next for me is The Lawn Job by Chuck Caruso. This came out in 2017 from Cloud Lodge Books. Craig Collins is an ex-con with a lawn care business and a sort of girlfriend named Juana, who's a transgendered stripper. After an incident where Collins loses his high-powered clients, he looks to get even. The client he pissed off is a pizza mogul named Big Gino Passarelli and his wife. Collins plans for payback by setting up Gino and Juana and making a sex tape to ultimately blackmail Gino into giving him the money that he and Juana want. Of course, things go wrong and chaos ensues. And like a calzone to the face, this one was a hit for me. I thought the author's treatment of Juana as the transgendered character was fair, especially for a crime novel. However, I could see how this might rub some people the wrong way. But overall, this story had all the ingredients for a great noir pizza pie. My second and last book this week, I just love this book, Gun with Occasional Music, is Jonathan Lethem's first novel. And I remember us talking about maybe doing this uh, in the future for a major Point Blank episode. This is a hard-boiled detective sci-fi fusion published by Harcourt Brace in 1994. It was nominated then for a Nebula Award for Best Novel. So... It's set in near future Oakland where humans live in a narcotic haze and evolved animals dress and behave like human beings. The protagonist is Conrad Metcalf, a PI. That means private inquisitor in our brave new world. Through his eyes, we get a good look at a dystopian world where mind numbing drugs called make are sold in shops. People collect karma points to avoid the freezer. News is communicated via pop songs, and asking questions is strictly prohibited unless you have a badge. At the story's outset, Metcalf is hired by Dr. Maynard Stanhunt to tail his wife Celeste. When Maynard turns up dead, things get complicated. A guy named Orton Angwine is framed for Stanhunt's murder, and Metcalf, in his quest to find out what really happened to Stanhunt, falls into a complicated scheme featuring baby heads, fast-growing babies, sex clubs, gangsters, and a trench coat wearing kangaroo named Joey. I love this book, just flat out. I thought it was really fun and and also engaging in a lot of ways. To be clear, though, I did listen to the audiobook version uh, on my way to work, and the telling was very good, and that might have influenced my general opinion. Nonetheless, I thought the story was very well paced. The sci-fi elements were interesting and light enough not to feel like a distraction, like some of the harder science science fiction stories. And the dialogue was straight out of Marlowe country. This was a total hit for me. That sounds great. I, I would love to do an episode where we talk about one of these sort of genre crossover type novels. And from what you're saying, I think we should. I yeah. I, I, I'm yeah, I'm sure we'll do it sooner than later. Yeah, that sounds like a good one. So maybe we'll we'll have to put that on the list. All right. For my last review uh, for this episode, I have Criminal Economics. This originally came out in 2013, and I read the 2017 reprint from Down and Out Books. This is from Eric Beatner. 
And if you listen to a lot of crime fiction podcasts, you might be familiar with uh, his show. This is a it's a new printing of what has been described as a cult classic. I had never heard of it before, but that's what they say. Um, and in this book, Bo and Slick, they're two bank robbers. They robbed the bank. They got the money, but they also ended up going to prison. On the night of their transfer from the local uh, jail to the state penitentiary, a hurricane is hitting, and it sends the van that they're in off the road. Bo and Slick are both able to survive the crash and escape. What follows is a crazy race for the hidden cash with one wild scene after another, and it involves a cast of characters that would only be believable because this story is set in Florida. Hmm. It's basically like a Coen Brothers film on the page and it's jacked up on speed and for me this one was a hit so you didn't find it it was too exaggerated or too outrageous you you thought it it, it worked overall i did and uh, there is that sort of florida crime subgenre of crazy capers uh, probably most notable sure. of those is carl hyacin um sure there were a couple moments in this where maybe it was just a, a little bit over the top but it, it didn't hit that way too crazy note that sometimes you find in Hyacinth's work. Okay. So what does that make it? Five five solid hits overall for us? Yeah, five hits. Uh, one of these times, Justin, we're going to have to do some misses. Yeah, we, we got to strike out. Uh, let's, let's aim to read some uh, terrible writing in the coming months. That's not a good goal. <laughs> but speaking of the opposite of uh, terrible writing, I think it's time to get to our main topic. I think so. But before we before we start talking about the postman always rings twice in any detail, I am curious to know what your initial impressions were, because I remember talking to you a while back about about this book, and I think there was some trepidation on your part about reading it. So what what, what do you feel about it? Well, I think my tr- my concerns about this book is because the last the last thing I remembered about it was the film. And I per- uh, I purposely yeah. did not watch the film this time. Um, it was on uh, on cable one night, and I I caught like two minutes of it, and I said, "No, I'm turning this thing off because I don't want it to spoil the book itself." And overall, I really enjoyed this movie or this book. I <laughs> it's been a long time. I can't remember if I enjoyed the film or not. I probably did, but I enjoyed the book, and and I think this goes to the credit of the book is that. I kept having to flip back to look at the publication date and to realize that this thing came out as early as it did. It felt like I was reading something much further along the evolution of this hard-boiled genre, and I think I think that statement speaks for itself. You make a good point there. 1934. That I I noted that too repeatedly. I'm like, seriously, this came out right when Chandler was just starting. And and uh, you know, it's not. Is it perfect? No, I would say this is a strong for me. This is like a four and a half out of five, maybe a four point seven five if I want to get technical. But <laughs> there's a couple of weird little twists in here that I had to be like, OK, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But overall, it's a solid not there. It's a solid story. There's a lot packed in a, in a small package and. It is definitely, you know, there's a reason why this is a classic. And how about you? What did you think about it? Well, uh, I'm with you in a lot of ways. I I like this book. I think it's I think it's very good, and I'm gonna give it a you know roughly a four point five as well. And I think part of the reason I love it is, like you said, it's economical. It does a lot with very little space. I mean, this thing, at least in the version I have, it's it's not much over a hundred pages. It's more like a novella, but it takes you. As as I'll, as you'll find out, readers or listeners, uh, after my summary, if you haven't read it already, it takes you through uh, you know romance and murder and the aftermath all in a very short amount of space, and it does so without. Um, I don't feel like anything's missing. I feel like the leaps, uh, the cuts to the writing, the ways that that Kane keeps the writing concise benefit the story, uh, even if it forces the reader to maybe do a little bit of mental math or connecting the dots on their own. But uh, overall, I mean, it's just real punchy writing. It has, it reeks uh, of, of Thompson who wrote later on, but also just the savviness of somebody like Dash Hammett, uh, just very aware of, of writing style, but also plot wise. This is I took a plot class and this is one of the stories we read in that plot class because it's, it's, 
it's very it's structured very soundly and it's very self-aware of of how it's dealing with acts and like the two parts to the book which we'll talk about so overall i mean there's just so much to say that's positive but i probably at this point should start with uh providing the readers or listeners a summary you know give give them the spiel so that they know what we're talking about yeah that sounds good justin no okay so let's dive in here the postman always rings twice published in 1934 is is James M. Cain's first and arguably most well-known novel. He also did Mildred Pierce and uh, what's the other one? Uh, Double Indemnity? Yes. Um, I haven't read those. I have them on my shelf, but this was his first. It got banned. It was a big sort of explosive like issue when it came out because it's racy, uh, a lot of sex and violence, or at least for the time. So it got a lot of press. The story takes place in Southern California and starts in a hay truck on a sun-baked strip of highway east of Los Angeles. This is a novel that details the build-up to a murder and the aftermath of the murder. The man's name, the protagonist or hero, if you want to call him that, uh, his name is Frank Chambers. He's a drifter, having spent time most recently in Tijuana. After getting tossed from the hay truck, he heads up road to the Twin Oaks Tavern to con his way into a bite to eat. There he meets the Greek, Nick Papadakis, and his wife, Cora. Instantly, there's a spark between Frank and Cora. The Greek offers Frank a job, and he takes it. For a while, they're a happy work family, Frank doing dishes and helping out with car repair. But Frank and Cora can't contain their lust for each other. It sort of burns in this book. And soon they plot a scheme to kill off the Greek while he's taking a bath. Thing is, it doesn't turn out the way they had planned. A stray cat gets into a fuse box and the electricity goes out right as Cora is about to blackjack the Greek in the bath. He ends up in the hospital. After this point, Frank runs away. He's a drifter. He doesn't want to stick around and deal with the consequences. It was a good gig, but he wants to hit the road, so he does. Weeks later, however, he runs into the Greek, now out of the hospital, at a Santa Monica market. The Greek pleads with Frank to come back to the tavern, and he does. He sees Cora there. And again, they start scheming. They plan a trip to the beach as a group, and on the drive out at night, they set it up, Cora and Frank do, so that the car goes off the road and into a canyon just east of Malibu. The scheme works perfectly, the Greek dies, and both Cora and Frank are brought in for questions. The DA, the district attorney, is, his name's Sackett, he pits the two people, Frank and Cora, against, the, against each other. They rat each other out independently, but because of competing insurance claims, both Cora and Frank are let off with, only their li- with not only their lives intact, but also with the fruit of Nick Papadakis' life insurance policy, 10000 bucks. Life is theirs to be had, clean and free with the money. They should be fine, you know, but they're not. The murder and the subsequent mutual betrayals dirties the water between them. When Cora leaves to attend her mother's funeral, Frank runs away with a new woman, a collector of big cats. Cats is a motif in this story. They go to Mexico, but then Frank decides not to go through with his escape and returns back home. Cora comes back home, and they, he keeps his near escape secret. Things really ramp up in this last act. The first act is about setting up the murder. The second act is about the consequences. A man in the hire of the attorney who got them off he, he arrives to the tavern to blackmail him with a confession that Cora made during one of the heated points of, of, of the trial. He has the transcription of what she said and is planning to use it against her uh, for a certain amount of money. He wants $25,000 in exchange for the document. But Frank strong arms him and within a day the threat is averted. However, while Frank is occupied with the blackmailer, the girl with whom Frank fled to Mexico comes to the tavern to drop off a baby puma. And she meets Cora there, who learns of Frank's transgression, essentially. Things are tense for a while. Cora threatens to call the DA and squeal on Frank for the murder. But they decide to stick it out when she reveals that she's pregnant. They head to L.A., get married, and afterwards go to the beach. In the water, Cora feels sick. Frank, in a panic, gets her to shore and tries to rush her off to the hospital. But in his reckless driving to get to the hospital, it gets into a car accident. And that is when Cora dies. Funny how things turn out. Frank is implicated and convicted of the murder of Cora, a murder that he didn't intentionally commit. 
The story is his confession from death row. Frank wonders if the killing of Cora was truly an accident or if perhaps it was his subconscious that killed her. The novel ends with prison men coming to take Frank to the execution chamber. So there's a whole lot of stuff happening in this story. This is like 116 pages uh, of writing and so many plot twists, so many moves, so many twists and turns and, and emotional ups and downs. Uh, some of it maybe feel feels a little bit, uh, I don't know, defined belief maybe, but somehow Kane manages to connect all the dots in a way that where I, n- I never felt like, sort of like that book you had just mentioned, I never felt as if the things were unbelievable. Uh, they came close, but uh, somehow it all it all snapped together in a way that worked for me. Four and a half kill shots, easy, and I'm sure we'll talk of some of the issues. But overall, I thought it was a pretty solid book, and it's just shocking that it came out in 1934. Yeah, that's a great summary. Thank you, Justin. All right, so let's take a look at the life of James M. Cain. Uh, just a brief look here, but he was born in 1892 in Annapolis, Maryland. He would... Uh, die in 1977 in University Park, Maryland. So he he started and ended his life in Maryland. And in between, he would become one of the founders of the hard-boiled school of crime fiction. Although, personally, Cain hated labels. His childhood was one that was, he was basically surrounded by education. His father was well-educated. His mother was an accomplished musician with formal music training. Uh, and his dad, we, it's, you might call him a professor, but he was actually more of a college administrator. Um, he would jump around a couple of different colleges in the Maryland area. And most uh, prominently, during Kane's childhood, he would be the president of Washington College. Now, this exposure to education and basically a, a leg up on the educational system meant that Kane graduated from high school at the age of 15. He went to his this college that his father was the president of, and he graduated from college by the time that he was 18. And he was basically immersed um, in an educational setting with a lot of you know school sports, school activities. He, and he would always feel a little bit uncomfortable, too, because of his age was he was advanced beyond what others, you know, the other students were a few years older than him. And once he graduated from college, he did kind of have this childhood of, I don't want to say leisure, but much more, perhaps more leisurely than most children of that particular era. Um, And he hadn't really had to worry about and didn't even think about what he wanted to do for an actual job until he graduated from college. And, um, you know, like most people trying to find themselves at that age, he, he jumped around from a number of different jobs. He was always sort of interested in writing, but he didn't really see that as an actual career until about 1914. And that's when he would seek out a career as a journalist, starting with the Baltimore American and later working for the Baltimore Sun. When World War I broke out, he was eventually drafted. And it's a little, it was a little unclear to me exactly what he did during the war, but he did get to the front lines. Uh, It looks like he worked mostly as an observer and a runner. Um, And he would also be tasked with doing some of the writing jobs, uh, you know, unit histories and stuff like that of the unit he was in. So perhaps some kind of moderately clerical job there. And perhaps most interesting is that he was on the front lines for the end of the war in that 11th hour of the 11th month, the end of World War I. After the war, he would go back to journalism and he would he would end up in New York working for the New York World and uh, a rather important magazine at the time, the American Mercury. I thought it was interesting that, I mean, of course, as a journalist, he covered many different things. But one thing that stood out to me and and is something that we've seen from a number of our different uh, writers in this genre is an exposure to working class issues. And this is one for a long time. He actually covered the, uh, the battles going on in West Virginia, particularly the Battle of Blair Mountain. And so those who aren't familiar, this was a big clash between the mine companies and the unions that were trying to organize the mines. And this broke out into armed conflict in, in the mountains there. And Kane would, he wrote a, a, a rather large piece uh, for one of the publications he worked for that was a little bit controversial. It wasn't, 
you know, there was a lot of concerns about, oh, it's too socialist or whatnot. But he took the he did take the position of the workers and um, he felt that that was that was the most accurate portrayal of the story that he saw up in in those mines. And he would even do a bit of investigative journalism where he took a job as a miner for several weeks and he worked in the mines to better understand the lives of the workers and after that experience, he and he did have, a, I guess, a near-death experience when something fell in the mine or something like that. Um, but he said after the fact that his initial words about the situation may have well been too soft. Um, he didn't last long because he was still trying to do journalism. So he, he was talking to the miners. And then he went and talked to the management. And once he talked to the management, the, the miners uh, didn't really want to have much to do with him anymore. So he left that. But anyway, you know, he was he was definitely committed to his journalism, I guess, is is my point here. Sure. And also, I think we'll see in his dialogue um, that he you know, this may have been one of the experiences, especially that of the war as well, where he took to uh, some of this more working class dialogue, which, you know, maybe as the son of a, a university president, he wasn't as exposed to uh, in his childhood. By 1929, he he decided he really wanted to write novels, that he was done with journalism. So he moves to L.A. around that time, and he gets a job as a screenwriter. I haven't heard of that one before in this program. <laughs> yes, yes. The you know this story is starting to sound pretty familiar to uh, a lot of our a lot of our writers here. He goes out to be a screenwriter, and he really doesn't. He doesn't find a lot of success at, throughout his screenwriting career. He He's employed, he's working, he's probably doctoring scripts and whatnot, but he doesn't actually get final credits uh, except for in two kind of lackluster films. Um, but what he, he does do out hmm. there is he's encouraged by friends to write a novel. At first, he would put out a short story collection, which was political satire, uh, entitled Our Government, and this came out in uh, 1930. And his first novel, as Justin said, is The Postman Always Rings Twice, and that came out in 1934, and really that would, would make his career. He would go on to write 22 novels and short story collections, and he would write until his death at, uh, at 85. And 29 of his stories were turned into films, some of them in multiple versions. Uh, other notable parts about his life, uh, sort of post screenwriting was he was he was an advocate for the rights of uh, screenwriters to hold some copyright to their work um, that was pretty important to him he would also be married four times and uh, but Kane himself would never have any children he had some stepchildren that he felt particularly close to but no children of his own so that's a little bit about uh, Kane's life and uh, let's move into the novel so so we have James Kane here he's raised I guess bourgeois middle class whatever he gets similar exposure that some of our other writers we've discussed dashiell hammett uh thompson to war and to working class issues in the first half of the 20th century and it clearly it influences him to some extent because the characters we have in this novel uh, one of them is a, a drifter i mean this novel set in in the great depression and there are certain certainly qualities of the great depression uh economic austerity, uh, people sort of scramble and making things uh, meet through limited means. There's this desire, this drifting quality, sort of like Thompson is a drifter. We have our main character here, Frank Chambers, f essentially getting kicked off of a hay truck. He's just wandering around, picking up odd jobs as he goes and getting into trouble. So, so yeah, he's, he's bringing, he's bringing these, these social conversations and in, into, into the writing. Um, I, who of all the characters we have? We have Frank, we have Cora, we have the Greek. Do we want to talk a little bit about Frank and sort of uh, get a sense of who he is before we talk about the others? Yeah, or let's go think? ahead and start with Frank. So, yeah, as you said, Frank is he's a drifter, he's a hobo, he's a he's kind of skirting around. I don't get the sense uh, in this that he's necessarily out of work by force. It seems like he kind of takes to this life. Um, but that's that's who Frank is. He has some skills. Uh, he can fix cars and and do some work around the around the place. Yeah, yeah, he's he's he doesn't have much in terms of moral scruples. He's just he seems to be an opportunist. He takes advantage of opportunities that arise and, and when the going gets tough, he hits the road again. And uh there's something appealing to that that drifting quality uh that makes him an interesting character. Uh but there's other aspects to his character uh that that 
there's more more psychological things that are going on here that that are particularly interesting to me. Uh, the fact that he the, the kind of trouble he seems to find himself in repeatedly sort of speaks to some deeper psychological issues, I think. Uh, but that's what makes the book yeah, work. Yeah, indeed. I mean, he does, a, you know, it is a sparse novel in a lot of ways, but he does allude to certainly having trouble with the law, having trouble with violence uh, prior to the events that happen in this book. And it seems that a lot of it has to do with just the certain, certain sort of narrow view of the world. He seems to have sort of have a adolescent immaturity about desire. He wants something and he's got to have it and nothing's going to get in his way. And then when the consequences come, he's like, Oh, I don't want that. And it's like, seriously, like you, that's the kind of mistake you repeatedly make. You, uh, it's, it's bound to, it's bound to burn you. Uh, and so it's no surprise that he ends up on death row at the end. But, uh, but it's how we get there, which is the most intriguing part. Yeah, so let's let's introduce those characters that lead him to that uh, eventual end. Uh, we have initially Nick is who basically gives him an opportunity. I mean, in this whole thing, Nick is kind of the guy you definitely feel sorry for. I mean, he doesn't seem to do that much uh, wrong. Um, he's running a business. He, he gives Frank a chance. Um, he's just, you know, in a lot of ways, he's just the owner of this restaurant and and his only crime is being uh, being a little older than his wife and maybe a little, you know, a little greasy uh, from probably all the uh, cooking he's doing. Yeah, but they just uh, explain that away through some implied racism, uh, which is convenient. Uh, Kane does. Yeah, um, yeah, Nick. Nick is the reasonable adult here. He's he's mature. He's humble. He uh, he owns something and he does something with his life. And he also appreciates and celebrates life too. He plays music and drinks too much wine and sings. Like he seems like somebody who's making the most out of you know uh, limited means. Uh, and he's surrounded by people, Cora and Frank, who uh, act like children who just want what they want and have temper tantrums and spy and connive and manipulate to get what they want. Well, we'll talk about who's actually doing the manipulating, but it seems they can't be satisfied with, with their situation or grow up. They're sort of stuck in this perpetual state of adolescence. That's, I get that impression in the way that they scheme and and get themselves into trouble. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it both, and let's, let's introduce Cora here. Cora is of course, Nick's wife and, you know, in, in many ways, the, the root uh, of the some of the issues here. Um, and, you know, I can't remember, but correct me if I'm wrong here. Cora basically justifies her marriage to Nick as that, like, he was just the easiest way out for her, right? Yeah, I mean, it, there's not much detail in it. Like we said, it's a pretty economical book. But, yeah, I think that that's how she, at least that's how she rationalizes it to Frank because, Obviously, she's got some she's got some conniving going on, too. She's playing Frank as much as he thinks he's playing her. Uh, But, yeah, I think it was a it was a marriage of convenience and and that's it. I think that's it. Yeah. So Cora just, you know, I I guess in today's day and age, you'd probably wouldn't be any question. You just get divorced and move on. But uh, apparently that wasn't that wasn't an option here. The question is, was she scheming to get away from Nick since she got with him? Or was Frank the first time that she had the idea to escape or to plan something against uh, Papadakis? I don't know. We don't we don't get any of that backstory. We're just we're just given what what what's on the page. Yeah, that's a good question. And maybe a way to answer that is to start looking at the relationship between Frank and Cora, because. You know, when you, I didn't really think about that, how long Cora had maybe been planning this, but there is an element to how, and this could just be Kane's writing style, but how this relationship with Frank and Cora just, I mean, it, it's quick. I mean, there's not a whole lot of buildup. There's not a lot of tension there. She just kind of, they kind of go after one another. And, um, I did find that part to be maybe a little bit, I don't know, I don't want to say not believable, but maybe it just meant that, the two of them were after, you know, what they were after, and it really had nothing to do with actually creating a relationship between the two of them. So, you know, maybe she was trying to, you know, she was the honey to attracting the fly kind of thing. That might be the case. I mean, you said quick, and it is quick. I'm looking at page five right now where Nick says, meet my wife. And she didn't look at me. I nodded at the Greek. She was just doing some dishes. She walked past. It wasn't a big deal. But by page 11, they're already... 
I took her in my arms and mashed my mouth up against hers. Bite me, bite me. And they dive into each other and, 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 and get nuts together when Nick's out of town. That's in five pages. We, we go from barely knowing each other to having this deep, illicit affair. And it's just fascinating how quickly we got there. And there is some, you know, how, how realistic is that? It depends. It feels like the, their, their desire was so submerged and so repressed that it, it just exploded violently. In yeah. A sense. Let, let me just continue um, that quote that you were reading there. Cause I mean, this speaks to how, sure. again, this is 1932. This book is pretty, pretty hot and racy because it says, bite me. She says, bite me, bite me. I bit her. I sunk my teeth into her lips so deep. I could feel the blood splurt into my mouth. It was running down her neck when I carried her upstairs. Yeah. That's some serious imagery. Yeah. That's some explicit sort of shocking, Violence as metaphor for sexual lust. Like you said, 1934, I remember us in our first episode talking about Thompson and how he described violent acts and sex in a way that was shocking. And we were like, remember, this was in like 1950. Imagine how people reacted. Well, Cain beat him by 16 years. Yeah. In fact, you know, I marked a few parts in this and this relationship is, you know, it's it's weird. Um it's yes, it's it's a little Yahoo. They're they're just off off yeah. uh, off the rails. Yeah, I mean, I'm other. not sure what you want to qualify this as because I mean, I will say that most of the, there's a lot of violence between the two of them during their their sexual uh, life here, um, but it does for the most part seem to be consensual on some level. Uh, here's another part later in the book. I hauled off and hit her in the eye as hard as I could. She went down. She was right down there at my feet, her eyes shining, her breast trembling drawn up in tight points and pointing right up at me. She was down there and the breath was roaring in the back of my throat like I was some kind of an animal and my tongue was all swelled up in my mouth and blood pouring in it. Yes, yes, Frank, yes. The next thing I knew, I was down there with her and we were staring at each other's eyes and locked in each other's arms and straining to get closer. Hell could have opened for me then and it wouldn't have made any difference. I had to have her. If I hung for it, I had her. Yeah, I mean, sex and violence, they're essentially indistingu- indistinguishable in this in this book, at least between those two. Uh, but then once they get to conniving, then there's a third, as- another aspect of violence, which is actual murder and, 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 and planning murder and violence in that manner. So murder, violence, sex violence, it all sort of ble- blends together, bleeds together in a, in a strange harmony that Cain had to be conscious of. I wonder if he was, this guy doesn't, he could, doesn't come from this violent street realm he's he's this middle class guy with you know middle class family and the sort of contained safe life so i wonder how much of this was him trying to be as risque as possible in order to make bank off the pulp market type audience or if or if this was just his internal you know his need because i know some some something about cain based on what we're going to be talking about later in his cookbook and his love for writing about food and opera he he's almost seems like niles crane or something uh but then he writes a book like this and it's like who is this guy what what was his motives for writing this story i'm i'm curious yeah and i think i do think that is something that's kind of left out of the biography of him because he he sort of denies this hard boiled label um and i have a quote about that later but he he denies it how does he deny it like has he read his books well he's sort of saying that he's just speaking the way that his characters would speak but okay okay and and Uh that's fair um but but you're right i mean there is a little bit of a disconnect uh with looking at his life and how he got to these characters and a lot of the other authors we've looked at and how they came up with the characters that they used um sure a lot of our other authors are frankly a lot closer to their characters than it appears that Kane is with, with these characters. That's an interesting point to make. I mean, in each of the people we've discussed, Patricia Highsmith and the way that she captures obsession and, and, and Thompson in the way that he captures sort of this back and forth, the, the split mindset, they all had, a, there was a shred or, or an aspect, a splinter of themselves encapsulated in the main character. And they were really examining themselves, these authors were, as they were creating these characters. And it seems it's hard, it's harder to pin Kane down, which part of him 
is 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 Frank Chambers or Cora or or is he simply the Greek? We don't the Greek who sings and likes to eat. Maybe that's who he is. Well, that could be. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about some of these. I mean, there aren't that many characters in this book. But is there anybody else who stuck up, stuck out for you, rather? Well, we're talking about the the first half. I see this book as having two acts. It's act one is the setup to the climax of the murder in the middle of the book. And then we have sort of the, the downfall. But the other major characters, or at least characters that have a sustained presence, are the are the legal characters. Once they once they get brought in for questioning, they're brought in and the district attorney sack it is we get we get this behind the scenes legal sort of insight between Sackett the DA and the and the defense attorney whose name I don't recall but they had the way that they're just using this murder and the competing insurance agencies as as bargaining chips in order to win all they care about is winning cases in murder sex violence all the all the human things that are contained within uh, the the emotional content of this novel they don't have any meaning anymore it's all just strictly business as usual and conniving and 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 scheming in a bureaucracy and so the, the the whole the whole emotional tenor of the book shifts when we enter into the legal system but Sackett is a is a standout I guess character because of it uh, his threat the way that he could uh, shape and, and change their lives and and how he almost does and then is is aver- averted by the defense attorney through some clever conniving of his own. Yeah, I can't remember the name of the other uh, lawyer either, but that change, you're right, that that change in the story where we get into this, this back and forth between uh, the lawyers essentially playing a game amongst themselves. They don't even really care all that much about the actual case against Cora and Frank. They really care about this this rivalry between each other and who can get as many convictions or defenses or whatever. Yeah, it's it's strange. The game the the game aspect is, is, I feel like there's gaming on two levels. There's the Frank and Chorus gaming, conspiring, and planning this this uh, attack or murder of the Greek, and then it's the gaming of Sackett and the other lawyer playing off of each other, how life's just a game, except for the Greek who happens to be like sort of the center, the linchpin, the moral center of this book. Yeah, and there's I think there's a, there's a lot of power dynamics in this book as well, because you have this power dynamic between Cora and Nick, you have the power dynamic between Cora and Frank, and what they do to Nick, then Once this happens, you have their, I guess their limited power is shown to be so insignificant compared to the power of the lawyers and essentially the power of the state to just, you know, play with maybe rightfully in this case, but play with their lives. And then ultimately in the theme of the book, I guess you could say that fate is the ultimate power, you know, that or karma or something along those lines, because that's what ultimately ends up happening to to Cora and Frank. That's true, because at the end, Frank ends up pay on the price. Cora pays the ultimate price. Frank pays the price of imprisonment for the crime he didn't commit, but it doesn't matter because once you're in the legal system, well, you're always in the legal system. And uh, it ended up working out karmically against him for his actions. William Marling writes that the postman always rings twice and also double, double indemnity. So this might be a theme theme in Kane's work. He, he thinks of the, the both narratives as sort of split in half. The first narrative functions as the realistic narrative of the reasons, Cora and, and Frank's scheming and all that. Then in the place of the initial sign system of desire, the desire which sets off the story, Kane substitutes a system representing the forces of techno-economic production, highly mechanical and logical, the legal system, the insurance industry, or business economics. That's such a strange way of creating a story, this idea of splitting it in two halves and looking at two different angles of how how relationships work. And I haven't read Double in, Indemnity, but it makes me... I have seen the film, which is really good, and Chandler wrote the script, but... It makes me think, what is what is Kane's rationale for building a narrative in that way? It's sort of an odd structure. Yeah, it is. It is. And it's also interesting that he essentially used it twice and that both of those stories are basically they're based on the real crime case of uh, Ruth Snyder from 1927. I don't know if you're familiar with that at all, but 
the the basics of that were she was this was a crime that was all over the news and whatnot and what she basically did is she killed she you know she conspired to kill her husband but she had fixed the insurance payments prior to that and despite the fact that in this novel there's no actual reference to the postman ringing twice they su- they suggest that it's the Snyder case that that Kane was referring to because in her testimony she said that how she fixed the insurance payments was if the the post she had worked it out with the postman that if something from the insurance company came he rang the bell twice so she would get a hold of them uh before her husband did interesting so but but it yeah it's it, it's in a kind of a weird case kind of an interesting as you said story uh, setup to not only to use it in the first place but to use it twice and to use it on such uh, I don't want to say gr- I guess groundbreaking novels you know you mentioned the title I I I just assumed because there hasn't been any clear explanation sort of like a non sequitur what what is the origin of the title what you just said makes sense uh, I was I figured it was like something more existential like. Uh, you know, the postman always rings twice. You're, you're never, there's no escape kind of thing. You know, like you're not going to get away. They tried to murder the person twice. There's a recurrence of cats twice in the novel. Like I felt like it's like a, once you make, take the plunge, uh, there's no, there's no way out. Either way, it's a, it's a novel, uh, novel title that, that I, I like novel t- titles like this that are, that are unclear or, or a little bit vague that raise questions that keep you keep you guessing yeah and uh you know kane um never really gave a, a good answer for the title so this is sort of like the the question we have from chandler as to uh who killed the chauffeur we're never gonna know mm-hmm. the other theory that i've seen about the title of the book and this is one that you know you have to have a certain amount of historical reference for is that at the time if the mailman delivered the mail and it was regular mail they would ring the bell once and if it was a telegram, meaning you had it had to be hand delivered, they would ring the bell twice. And what was what most people felt at the time is that when you got a telegram, it was going to be bad news because there was urgency to it. Mm. Interesting. So, so the bad news being death, or, or I wonder if you'd get a telegram for the receipt of like an, a life insurance policy too, like something like that requires a signature. Yeah, that's quite possible. So these are the main characters. Do you have anything else about the characters before we move on to plot, style, setting, and other things? Yeah, we've already started to cover some of those things, but before we officially move sure. away from our characters, um, did you have a Puss Walgreen for uh, this this episode? Damn, I don't, I don't, I don't have one. So okay, I do not. All right. Uh, so for new listeners, our Puss Walgreen award goes back to. Um, the work of Chandler and Puss Walgreen is sort of a throwaway character with a goofy name. So every episode we'd like to pick a character whose name makes us uh, chuckle a little bit. And um, for me, it this isn't, you know, this isn't a great one because there's not a lot of characters here, but I had to go with the uh, the DA Sackett. You went with Sackett, huh? Yeah. Interesting. I just, I found out the other name, uh, that other lawyer's name is, is Katz. So K-A-T-Z. So there's another cat reference. There's a repeated motif of cats. But um, so Sackett. Why? Why Sackett? I don't know. There's just something about the sound of Sackett. I don't know. It's just like, I don't know. It's like suck it or fuck it or something like that, you know? Okay. Okay. So just something in the tone. Yeah. How about I'm going to go with Goible, which isn't, I'm not sure how if that's how you pronounce it, but Goible is the guy you call up to go. He, he boards cats. I, this is like, this is probably the most absurd moment in the book. And we haven't really talked about like these little, there's these little subplots. Like in the second half, Frank Chambers, the, all the shit's already gone down. They've, they've murdered the Greek. They've been arrested. They've been let go because cats got them off because of a technicality. And then they've been fighting. Cora leaves to go attend to her, her mother's funeral. And Frank ditches, like literally like in the same parking lot, he waves to Cora goodbye on the train and he sees another girl in a car and they, and he starts hitting up like macking on her, like just like what a sleazeball. But he does this and they ended up, they end up talking and she's like, I study cats, big cats. She has pumas and tigers and shit. And she's like, I'm off to Nicaragua to like trap more cats and start like a cat zoo entertainment center like i don't know what the hell is happening here but he's like well why don't we just hit the road and she's like i should go home and babysit my cats and then he's like well let's just get like this cat guy i know his name's goibles like who (laughs) will call up goible and tell him to come get them 
He'll board the whole bunch while we're gone for a hundred bucks. Like he just happens him, Frank Chambers, the drifter who just sort of showed up one day. Is, is he some omniscient God? He knows the guy in this County that babysits giant cats. Like I, it's such a weird, weird little moment. Yeah. Okay. You got me on, uh, on the Puss Walgreen this time. Cause <laughs> that's, that's a good one. And, 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 you know, yeah. I, I did see some themes in this book, but I didn't get the cat theme. I mean, that I, I get it now that you say it, but t- talk a little bit more about that and uh, and what you think yeah. that means. OK, well, I mean, I've, I've read a couple articles where where somebody mentioned the motif, but then I went back and thought about it. We have at the beginning uh, the reason the first murder fails, the murder with the bathtub where they tried to she was going to like hit nick in the head while he was taking a bath and make it look as if he had fought fell in the shower what happens is uh this cat which is like walking around in the yard a cop drives by at night and sees frank outside sort of monitoring the situation and they both comment on this cat which creates like a memory it's like obviously that's the 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 cop's going to remember the scene of the crime if they actually go off with the murder and everything happens according to plan but anyway we see this cat the cat ends up chewing or stepping on the fuse box and the power goes out and the murder doesn't go off. I mean, it doesn't mean anything then, but then there's this recurrence of the cat thing again with her, him meeting the lady who, who takes care of big cats and then, and then wants to start this education center zoo thing of big cats. And then she brings him a baby Puma toward the end of the story, which causes the final unraveling between him and Cora. Cora is going to rat him out to the DA. Their whole thing starts to, to, to crumble. And that might be where he, Frank, plant, plants subconsciously in his mind the idea of getting knocking off Cora too, even if he doesn't really mean it, even if it isn't something he actually acts on. It's something that maybe is planted because they, they continue to be going at each other's throats. And so why the cats? What does the cat represent? Is the cat Frank? Is the cat like this this thing that can't keep creating problems? Like the cats in both cases create problems. Uh, I don't know. I don't know truly what if it's more than just a thing like Cain likes cats, so he wants to reference cats, or if he's trying to create more there than than there really is. I'm sure we can do a literary study on it and find a bunch of bullshit analogies and metaphors and symbolism in the cat. But I don't. I don't really know exactly what he was going for there. Just that it in a in a 116 page book. There's a lot of little references to cats that seem to feel as part of some kind of system that Kane's designed. Okay, I see what you're saying there now. I mean, I, I guess I had forgotten about at least uh, at least the delivery of the baby cat as being a key element. But that that theme, now that you mention it, uh, now somebody can write a, a master's thesis on that or something. Exactly. So there you go. We're giving you some master's thesis ideas here on Point Blank. But uh, it's a freebie. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's got to be something to that, because usually in in writing, you know, if if something or in any storytelling, when things happen in threes, that's that's important. The cat, the cat is a is a lonely creature. They're isolated. They're uh, they're solitary. I wonder if there's something there. And it's that notion of the solitary. And there's also a, the sense of cats as are while they're somewhat domesticated, they're not totally domesticated. It, That's true. And, he, and just like Chambers, who's wild, who's, who it, plays with domesticity, ex- but can't every time he finds a good situation, he tries to break free from it. Exactly. And the, what what that ties into is one of the themes that I saw is that you have all these moments of, of Frank um, essentially feeling that he's trapped. And a lot of the bad decisions that he makes are because he feels trapped. And that that yeah. that's, you know, when he leaves the first time and he ultimately comes back, he's kind of... He's kind of pulling himself back in. He's kind of trapped when he has this affair with the cat lady, whose name I'm spacing right now. That's because he he feels trapped. And I assume the reason that she's like so exotic and they're talking about going to Nicaragua and all this sort of thing is sort of to just speak of this idea of, you know, that the drifter part of being a drifter is that you can take off and do whatever the hell you want at any time. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And then when, when Cora and him are, are running the restaurant and they, they talk about having the beer license and making it this big thing. And Frank is like, no, I don't really, I don't want to stay. I want to get out of here. He's the one who I got the sense that he definitely deep feel, felt deep down that he wasn't the settled life wasn't for him. He had to get back on the road. So I can see a parallel between that idea of, of Frank and the idea with the cats. And there's an additional thing of they're going to Nicaragua theoretically 
to find wild free cats and put them in cages. So there we go. Another piece of the puzzle. Yeah, there we go. It's uh, we've got the whole postman always rings twice figured out for you. And the the woman's name, the uh, the cat lady, her name was Madge Allen. So so now we know. Well, there. <laughs> did you have other themes that you that you found throughout the book? I had a couple of minor themes. I had just you know my one question was what does the killing do to the minds and hearts of the two main characters? That was an interesting piece. This story has one of the best first lines in hard boiled fiction for me. I just love that first line. Can I read it real quick? Please. They threw me off the hay truck about noon. That's it. It just gets thrown right into the plot and the plot never stops. It just it it just flashes forward at such a speed, economical clarity of writing and everything. I just I love I remember reading that uh, 10 years ago and going, "Wow, that's that's punchy. That's some good stuff." So, what kind of stuff do you uh do you want to add to our discussion of theme and whatnot well i you know we we talked about that theme of of lust and sort of power dynamics and abuse plenty already sure i mean i don't know do you have any more to say on that because oh i know one thing we did where i wanted to discuss on that is who do you feel between frank and cora has has the power in this book who i mean i think cora does at its root i think she wields the power for the most part. Well, I feel like she does in a lot of cases, but it's not it's not absolute and the the power thing does shift because Frank leaves. Like he leaves repeatedly, but it seems that when he does return, I think she's the one who plants the seeds for the murder initially and they rekindle the murder idea. I think it's with with her as the catalyst. So that's that's my impression. What what about you? I might be misreading it. No, I I kind of I would agree. I do think that one of the things that the novel pulls off well is that that dynamic between the two of them shifts a couple of times and it's not consistent. I you know, I think there's times in the narrative where not only does Frank think he has the, the more power in the relationship, but he actually does. And then there's other times when Cora it, it flips back and forth to Cora. Ultimately, I think she's the one who, who has the power. Would you agree that, that the Greek is sort of the the moral center of the story? Well, he's certainly the only innocent. I would I would have totally agree yeah. with that. I'm not even sure that he is the moral center. I mean, maybe in a way he is because he's just the hardworking guy who has a business and is just trying to get by. And, you know, he's, he's trying to be nice with Frank and give him some work, give him an opportunity. And then all of this, you know, happens. Well, ultimately he gets killed. Yeah, I don't know. I guess he's, I guess I feel like he's not, he's not developed. He's kind of a one note character in a lot of ways. That's true. That's true. When you said one note, I thought about his death scene. And I don't know if you recall, but when he gets killed in Malibu at night, but near the cliff in the car, he gets hit in the head by, I believe, a wine bottle and he was singing. He was singing uh, out into the canyon and the canyon was creating echoes. And so there, he, they were sort of commenting him and Frank on how that's beautiful. He can sing and it produces sound. And and then as he was making these, these, these notes, uh, Frank found the opportunity to kill him, hit him in the head. He dies. And as he's laying there slumped dead, his voice is still echoing in the canyon and i read somewhere that somebody called that like cliche or a little contrived and i'm like seriously in 1934 like i thought that was i thought that was a beautiful little poetic moment yeah again the time again with this book i had to look back at that copyright more than once just to remind myself of when it came out because there are there are definitely things in here that if you wrote this exact same book today it would be a cliche exactly but they have to start somewhere yeah and here you go so we have these themes we had the the cats, the the lust, the trapness. Another thing that I thought as a theme was smell. He brings up smell a lot more often than I normally normally see in writing. And I'm not exactly sure what the point of that was, and I don't have a good quote, but it was something that I noted. It, a lot of it had to do with the smell of the restaurant, the the greasiness of Nick, and I don't know if that was to to maybe give us at least some reason why Cora would want to kill him or not, but I'm not sure what's there, but I feel like there there is something to that theme. I don't recall particular smell descriptions, so I guess I'm not getting that, but do you have any specific examples of like what kind of things smelled? Regarding smell, I do have one 
quote here, and this is again, this is used to sort of justify Cora's actions. Um, she says she's talking about Nick and she says he's greasy and he stinks. And then she uh. also she also makes a sense. She makes a co- contrary comment about Frank where she talks about his his smell and how he smells clean. Now, I feel like there's some racial stuff just embedded in in the in that contrast. I, yeah, yeah, I think you're right because just before that, I have a, a number of notes about race, and I was wondering if that would be a theme, but it really kind of disappears after the first few pages. It seems like Kane was trying to establish Frank as as the good Aryan drifter, and Papadakis as the untidy immigrant, um, as a way of sort of framing who one should like and who one should not like. But then those impressions are subverted when we find out that Frank's just sort of an opportunistic dickhead and the Greek is the pleasurable, happy, kind, good person who dies horrifically for no reason. So, Which is an interesting statement in and of its own, right? I don't know if that was something Cain was thinking about, but you could certainly make that argument you know, once you put it on the table there. Uh, and any final words on the story before we move into subject unknown? Yeah, just to to wrap this up a little bit, um, I did want I didn't want to come away from this book saying it was entirely perfect. There were a couple of holes in it for me, and I did want to mention those things fairly quickly. But before I say that, I do have to you know I do have to say that at the end of the book, we this is a deathbed confessional in from Frank's point of view. So the fact that the the murder of Nick is described in like, well, it's so perfect, we've got it all worked out, whatever. Well, maybe it wasn't as perfect as described by by Frank. And that was one of my holes with the, with this this narrative is when they get caught from the accident, it seemed to me that like the prosecutor figured out this was a murder like way too quickly for it being a traffic accident. And I realized that that was done in part to just keep the the novel moving. But it was a part where I was like, wait a minute, like they would have come to this conclusion within like a few hours of of the incident occurring. And are you talking about the murder of, of the Greek or are you talking about the traffic accident? I'm talking about the murder of the Greek uh, because they, they sure they pretty much haul Frank and Cora in almost immediately with with that death. Yeah, you, it make, you make a good point. It seemed a little bit rushed. Like, I mean, I guess just in, in general sense of things, like how often have you ever heard of a faked traffic accident which is really a murder which you know which immediately upon arriving arriving on the scene the police realize that and like that just you know i don't know <laughs> it's a little quibble with a with a book um but there were a couple of transitions within the story where it was abrupt and it it maybe could have used a little a little ironing out maybe he was a little too concise i i wrote somewhere I wrote down the name Gordon Lish, who was the editor of Raymond Carver, who is one of my favorite authors, but he got uh, accused in the 70s or more recently, but uh, accused of editing Raymond Carver's work to the extent that it wasn't even Raymond Carver, Carver's work anymore. He edited it so extremely and made it so minimal that it, it, it ended up lacking a lot of what the author's true intention was. And I was like, I wonder if Kane might have I wonder if he edited it down to make it this concise or if he had an editor's help, but it felt like he could have added a few more pages here or there to really sort of connect the dots. I like the brevity, but there's some points, like you mentioned, where maybe a little more detail would help connect things and make it uh, clearer for the reader. I do get the sense from the the brevity of this book and some of the others like it that we've read that uh, there's a pretty... I would think a pretty strong connection from the fact that he was a screenwriter. And even if he was sort of failing as, well, not failing, but not succeeding it to the level that he wanted to as a screenwriter, this this book, because of how it's structured, how it's, it's, it's shorter, it makes that transition to a screenplay much easier. Graham Greene wrote The Third Man, which is a book we might talk about someday. And it was one of his shorter books. And it was a real punchy, plot-driven crime novel or, or I guess noir or something, but it's a real, it's a good book, but he wrote it with the intent of making it a screenplay. So it sort of has this, a similar feel to Kane. It just, it dives right in. It's punchy. It says what it needs to say and gets out. And maybe, maybe you're right. Hitting the nail on the head with the idea that he was thinking screenplay. 
he was in Hollywood. I mean, this was the time when he was trying to do the the screenplay thing. So maybe that's what his goal was, get it out to the movies. I edit that it was filmed three times. Uh, I mean, and all of his, so many, so much of his work was converted uh, to, to the screen. You know, we were talking about the legacy here of James M. Kane, And, you know, he really is one of the founders of this genre that we you know, we have a podcast to talk about hard-boiled fiction. You know, this book, it often makes it onto lists of the 100 best novels of the 20th century. You talked about um, using it in a plotting class. I've heard, I've seen that myself, that uh, there's a lot of authors and, and screenwriters who who say that Cain should be really used all the time as a fundamental author to read to understand plotting. And you, I think you can see that in this book. Not only does he stand as one of the top three, like I think I see his name with Hammett and Chandler often, like Kane, Hammett and Chandler, because of the time period, 1934. He was one of the early progenitors of the of the genre. Now, in terms of influence, uh, he also, it's been said that uh, he influenced this this novel in particular, influenced Albert Camus' The Stranger. It's a slight plot reversal, but essentially in The Stranger, a man is found guilty of a crime because of his prior unnatural behavior toward his mother. In Postman, Frank is found guilty and declared a mad dog, not for the original murder, which he did not commit, but for the alleged murder of Cora. But this, at its root, was the this, this sort of flip reversal of punishment and being committed for a crime that you didn't quite do is what what Camus directly borrowed from Kane's writing. So it has an influence beyond the genre, but extends to other types of writing and other types of uh, craft. Kane definitely throughout his well, the middle of his career anyway, he was you know was pushing boundaries. He was pushing the limits of what was acceptable for sex and violence to be in a book for the time. You know, you talked about this book was was banned in Boston. You know, one of his his uh, uh, serenade was basically banned by the Catholic Church for what he talked about in there. And but at the other hand, uh, Cain never wanted to be labeled as hard hard boiled, which, like you said, is kind of crazy. But in his uh, his preface to Double Indemnity, which this is often quoted from him, but he said, I made no conscious effort to be tough or hard boiled or grim or any of the things I am usually called. I merely try to write as the character would write. I never forget that the average man from the fields, the streets, the bars, the offices and even the gutters of this his country has acquired a vividness of speech that goes beyond anything I could invent. And that is. If I stick to his, this heritage, this logos of the American countryside, I shall attain a maximum of effectiveness with very little effort. Interesting. And I have a final uh, statement, and this is from Joyce Carol Oates, who wrote a short essay on Cain. Cain's parable, which is perhaps America's parable, may be something like this. The passion that rises in us is both an inescapable part of our lives and an enemy to our lives, to our egotistic control of ourselves. Once unleashed, it cannot be quieted. Giving oneself to anyone, even temporarily, will result in entrapment and death. The violence lovers do to one another is no more than a reflection of the proposed violence society holds back to keep the individual passions in check. Subject on no. Subject unknown, this episode, we're going to be talking a little bit about the James M. Cain cookbook. Yes, that's a thing. And the subtitle is Guide to Home Singing, Physical Fitness, and Animals, Especially Cats. Really? That's all in it? <laughs> yes. Yes. So this was edited by Roy Hoops and Lynn Barrett. Hoops is the author of Cain, the authorized biography of James M. Cain. Did you read that by chance? I have to admit I skimmed it. I didn't even realize that it was a thing, so I'm glad somebody did. And Lynn Barrett teaches at Florida International University. Uh, she was a professor of mine back in the day. Now, they put together this book a while back, and it's a collection of some of James Cain's writings. He says he wasn't a hard-boiled writer. That wasn't his his goal. You know, a lot of our a lot of the guys we've discussed don't claim crime fiction as being their number one passion. It was a way to make money. But in this case, James M. Cain already had a pretty interesting career as a journalist, uh, as you mentioned, when he going down into the mines and doing some of that more investigative work. 
but he also did this <laughs> this crap, this like personal interest stories for newspapers. And these are some of the things he wrote about. He wrote about drink, about the qualities of liquor and spirits. He wrote about soup and stews, like making iguana soup or black bean soup. He wrote about fish. He tried to get catfish uh, renamed so that people would start eating it in restaurants. He wrote an essay called How to Carve That Bird. He wrote an essay, uh, multiple essays on spaghetti, uh, desserts, (laughs) square donuts. He talked about singing because apparently... When he lived in Hollywood, uh, he and one of his wives would have people over for dinner. He would cook them spaghetti, make them mint juleps, and then they would sing. That's a thing, you know, entertainment. Physical fitness, he talked about uh, different techniques and also about animals. He has a essay called The Raccoon, for example. He also tried to get muskrat be made into a, a national dish. He wanted muskrat to become a popular dish, and he, he wrote articles trying to promote it. So I have a few here that I'd like to share with you. Just I'll talk a little bit about the introduction to this book to give you a sense. And then and then we'll I'll give you a few examples just for fun. The year was 1934 and the ex newspaper man and unsuccessful Hollywood screenwriter James M. Kane had almost overnight become the most controversial author in the country. The book was, which propelled him out of obscurity was The Postman Always Rings Twice, which not only rocked readers and critics, but shook the publishing world. Alfred Knopf, his publisher, was urging Kane to write another novel, and his agent, Edith Haggard, in New York, was pleading with him to write a magazine serial or some short stories, preferably about murder, adultery, or any subject that would be suitable for the much-distressed, hard-boiled prose of James Kane. Already he was being called a tough guy writer. In Hollywood, Kane was working furiously, mostly on treatments for screenplays. His syndicated Hearst column and an idea for a series of articles on what was really his favorite subject. He sent the first on how to carve a turkey to Mrs. Haggard and an outline for more articles on midnight spaghetti, crepes Suzette, Christmas eggnog, a wild duck dinner, the mint julep, etc. Mrs. Haggard could not believe it. With the magazine world at your feet, she replied desperately, with their hands raised high over their heads, pleading with you for short stories, you want to write food articles. Please, she pleaded, for the little widow, do a story. I just know the winter will be long and hard. So this is the setup. In the midst of his great fame, in the midst of the point where he was becoming this uh, important figure in hard-boiled fiction, he wanted to write about how to cut duck meat and make spaghetti. (laughs) <laughs> Any thoughts? I, I'm not. Is, is it is it what you expected from the guy? I when you brought this up, I thought maybe we were going to be it was going to be a cookbook of nothing but hard boiled eggs and, uh, you know, yeah, maybe no. dishes called revenge that have to be served cold. Uh, but uh, no, this isn't what I expected. One of the first ones is huckleberry pie. It starts the pie season is here. All those things of which pie is made can be had fresh and cheap, which brings to mind a neglected public issue, the deterioration of huckleberry pie. And he goes on to discuss why huckleberry pie isn't being respected as a culinary item anymore. And he starts arguing for what makes a good huckleberry pie. It created a big uh, scene. Like there was a a back and forth between uh, multiple uh, issues of the paper, people writing and complaining about his take. And this was some serious national debate. This was happening uh, in the midst of the Roaring Twenties. He wrote in this manner about food and about singing up until 1977, toward his death. This isn't something that he played with when he was poor and young. He, this was something that was really meaningful to him. Here's one called Renaming, Renaming the Catfish. I have been going into this question of another name for the catfish in order that it may take its place on elegant menus and win the acclaim to which its quality entitles it. So doing, I have borne in mind the fight made by the avocado growers who have recently got rid of the word alligator pear, which had plagued them for years. So he goes on to try to figure out what we can rename the catfish. And he looks to Native American words for the catfish. And he comes up with the Osage who called the catfish tus or tusi, T-U-C-E. And he liked that word. So his argument was that we would call it Tusi. Uh, he says, 
Tusi would be a plausible addition to this list, and it sounds, it sounds like a fish meant to be eaten, not photographed. I therefore call on all patriotic restaurateurs to give the catfish a tryout under this name and see what happens. Now, the funny thing is, one restaurant, at least in New York, actually did it. They started calling catfish Tusi Fish a la Cane, and it was a hit, and the guy called Cane and told him. Well, I mean... Uh... I guess uh, having a dish named after you in New York City is is something of an accomplishment. It's interesting here. He certainly wasn't successful in renaming the catfish or making muskrat a national dish. You know, the interesting thing about food writing and, and even writing about music is it's hard. You know, how do you describe these things that we experience on a regular basis in new and unique ways? I actually think food food writing is is when it's done well is one of my favorite genres of of that sort of specialized uh, writing. I, I can't say if James Cain was a great food writer. I, I'd have to leave that up to people reading his food stuff in detail, but he was certainly interested in it and it excited him in a way. It seemed like to be his comfort zone, whereas hard-boiled noir writing was his way to make some bucks and achieve fame another way. Well, I, I mean, I guess when you're writing about uh, lust and violence and, and double crossing, you have to... You have to do something to uh, cleanse the palate uh, in between. Uh. If you consider eating muskrat a palate cleanser. Um. <laughs> there is one missed opportunity from all of his interests here, you know, and that's, I think, his opera singing. You know, I knew I know he was uh, sort of shot down on that from his mother. She said that he didn't have what it took to be a professional singer. But just think of this combination. What if we had gotten... The poetry of Raymond Chandler put to operatic music by by mm, Kane. That could have been beautiful. It's it's a missed opportunity. He did translate his music. Uh, sadly, we don't. I don't think we have any uh, tape of it. But he did refer to music in the same way he references sex and food in his novels. He they are themes that recur. He actually wrote a novel which I haven't heard of up until now called Career in C Major. It was not a hard-boiled novel, and it was like about an aspiring opera singer who marries another singer, and one of them succeeds and one of them fails or something like that, and it leads to some kind of conflict. So he was committed enough to the art of singing to to write about it, though his career didn't pan out. He did, at least one of his wives was an opera singer. Well, the, the many so, interests of James N. Kane. Yeah, and we could go on and on, but I, I don't think we should. I just wanted to bring this book to... To y'all's attention, it's an interesting one, and it does show James Kane's range and interests. And if you want insight into who he was as a crime writer, this is one angle by which you can sort of penetrate his his tendencies and desires and the things that he he makes into uh, crime fodder for his books. If only I'd known that ahead of time, I would have prepared some muskrat and uh, huckleberry pie. James if Kane. you have not read Postman, I suggest that you. Uh, Gather together, uh, make a batch of mint juleps, cook up a few muskrats, and sit down and enjoy his fine, hard-boiled novels. On that delicious thought, uh, let's bring another episode of Point Blank to a close. Before we leave, is there anything that you wanted to plug, Justin? I'll say this real quick. Um, For those of you who live in the New Mexico area uh, and haven't been to Meow Wolf, you certainly should go. They're blowing up right now. It's a weird-ass art installation slash amusement park slash surreal mystery house uh, where clues are provided, but no answers are easily presented. Pay to enter, and it's like a maze, a surreal dream maze of images and tunnels and lights and sort of like a, a puzzle, a trippy puzzle for artists. Anyway, this place is really cool, and they opened up. It was actually funded by George R. 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 Martin, and who lives in Santa Fe, and it's a real cool, real unique experience. If you're ever in the Santa Fe area, check it out. They're exploding right now to the point where they, they're opening up a new Meow Wolf in Denver and, strangely, in Las Vegas. It's, it's such a beautiful, unique exhibit. How about you? No, that sounds good. Let's move into the future episodes. Episode 11, we have The Doomsters by Ross McDonald. Following that, we have episode 12, which is the last episode in our classics series. And here we return to Dash Hammett's The Maltese Falcon, a novel that we are certainly not going to forget about as it's one of the classics. Then in episode 13, what do we have, Kurt? Episode 13 is 
Queen Pin by Megan Abbott. So we're going to move into some newer stuff here in uh, Megan Abbott's take on the classics of the genre. Episode 13, we're going to we're going to do a blockbuster. Uh, we're going to do Girl with the Dragon Tattoo and we're going to do an introduction to Nordic Noir. I'm looking forward to that. I haven't read any Nordic Noir really, so I, I've been holding off. So this will be as fresh and new to me as it is for maybe about three others out there because everybody seems to have read this stuff already. Yeah, I think we're going to use this well-known piece as sort of a backbone for a larger discussion um, of the the Nordic noir genre, which is is just, if anything, just growing bigger and bigger every year. We look forward to your questions, folks. If you have anything for us, uh, we're still growing and developed. This is our 10th episode, so we've hit the uh, metric decimal mark or whatever. But we're still evolving the program. Like we, like we mentioned earlier, we're going to switch into a, a two- episodes per month mode where we split each of our major episodes into two parts. If you have any questions or recommendations, you can uh, look us up at pointblankpodcast.com. We're on Facebook as well. You can check us out at Point Blank Hard Boiled Noir and Detective Fiction. And what's our Twitter handle, Kurt? Do you know what that is? I'm not actually sure what Twitter is. No. <laughs> That's um, perfect. Uh, it's if if you're on Twitter, folks, uh, we try to uh, post cool things on there every once in a while. When I remember, it's at point blank noir, one word, and that is also our Gmail account. If you want to send us a quick a recommendation, or if you have a book review for us, or if you if you're a publisher and you want to contact with us about advertising or give us money, we'll take it. Maybe point blank noir at gmail.com yeah and you can always uh, do us a favor by sharing the links to the show with a friend who might be interested and it does really help if you give us a review on itunes i know not everyone uses itunes as their source for podcasts but if you log in there and give us a review that does really help and thanks again for listening to point blank thanks folks see you next time see you my ass it's fucking radio <laughs> Point Blank is under a Creative Commons license. Music is by Justin. Copywritten works are property of their respective holders. Point Blank.